Commission. The Historic Preservation Commission is a nine-member board appointed by the City Council and serves on a voluntary basis without compensation. The purposes of the Commission are to promote the educational, cultural, economic, and general welfare of the City through the preservation and protection of buildings, sites, structures, areas, and districts of historic significance and interest through the preservation and enhancement of local historic, architectural, archaeological, and aesthetic heritage found in the city through the maintenance of the distinctive character of the city's historic districts and through the promotion and enhancement of the city's historic and aesthetic attraction to tourists and visitors. I would like to take this opportunity to ask the other members of the Historic Preservation Commission to introduce themselves, and I'll start from the audience left and my right. Cindy Keeping. Dallas Hanbury. Carol King. James Long. And I'm Richard Baylor, as I've already indicated. And i also like to recognize from the land use staff, Ms. Christy Anderson to my right and the audience left, and Ms. Paula Wade to my left and the audience right. And we'd just like to, as we do at each and every one of our meetings, thank them for taking the time out to help us with our deliberations here this afternoon. To our other commissioners, you have a copy of the action of the July 9, 2019 meeting. The chair will now entertain a motion for its adoption. Uh, I move we approve the uh, minutes from the last July meeting. And I second. So moving properly second, is there any unreadiness? There being uh, none, all those in favor, let it be known by a show of hands. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Just like to bring the audience's attention and our other commissioners' attention to an annexation map that we have with us this afternoon. This map shows how each area of our current city was annexed, and the map begins in 1819. And I would just like to ask each person within the sound of my voice if you know when your area was annexed and became a part of the city of Montgomery. And if you don't, this map is available for every person. There's no charge, there's no fee, and you don't need an appointment to see it. But this map will tell you when your area was annexed, and if you are interested in knowing when areas surrounding your areas were annexed, then all you have to do is to find your area and um, you'll have a clue as to when your area was annexed. It is color-coded so that you can match the colors with the year and determine generally when your area was annexed. A very beautiful map. I say that to say also, I gave a tour of a city about two weeks ago to a group, and these people were just absolutely amazed that at one time, People live in what we today call downtown Montgomery, on Dexter Avenue, on Monroe Street. Um, these were residential areas at one time. And this is the kind of understanding that an annexation map of the city of Montgomery can um, help all of us to understand just a little bit better the rich heritage of our cities. Before we move forward, is there any question that anyone would like to ask about the annexation map? Or any comment, not necessarily a question, but any comment. Is it available online? That's a good question. Is it available yeah. online? If it, if, Is it available if it's online? Print, if it's not printed out to the plotter, wouldn't it yes. be a digital file? I don't know how, who, how they produce the map. It's, it's probably dynamically generated out of our mapping system and not a PDF or anything. Not a JPEG Yeah, or it's a layer right. in the GIS right. program. Right. Yeah. But if, a, if any individual wants to take a close look at this annexation map beginning in 1819, as I've uh, already stated, just call city planning for the city of Montgomery and uh, get on somebody's appointment book and come downtown 
and uh, take a peep at it. I think every person will really learn something by seeing just how Montgomery has expanded since 1819, not 1919, but 1819, okay? Thank you very much. Our committee report, revamping the historic sign program, working committee, Cindy Keeping and Carol King. Um, it's slow, very slow, but this is an important process, um, and I feel pretty strongly that we get it right. Um, we have talked to several vendors um, about you know the materials and how much they would cost. What we uh, currently use is a 15 inch wide, 18 inch high, um, 063 grade aluminum. Um, and so then we, there are lots of things to decide, which goes down to when you're asking for um, the proposals for somebody, you know, um, are we gonna use a screen ink? Are we gonna go with a vinyl? We've also talked to the design uh, firm that we talked about earlier this afternoon, and they're very interested in looking into it. I sent the JPEG to them to just look at it and sort of start thinking about what they might. Um, this particular firm is um, familiar with historic signs. Um, and um, so I are think they equipped to design too? Hmm? Are they equipped to design something new? They're, no, they're, yeah, these are designers, period. Okay. And then these other people um, are actually producers. So that's sort of where we are at this point. We got some things in the works, um, but uh, I had told the de this particular design firm that we'd sit down with them and sort of show them some, what we were thinking about to move forward a little bit, so. Okay. That's all we got right now, sorry. Any other question or comment to either Cindy Keeping or Carol King? Let me just throw this question out. For those persons who might be new to the city or new to our broadcast, first of all, let me ask some perhaps elementary question. What's the difference between a historic sign and a historic marker, and how does a person go about getting a historic sign? First of all, the difference between a historic marker and a historic sign, and how does an individual go about getting a historic sign? Well, right now an individual can't get a historic sign, so that's how you go about getting one you can't. <laughs> okay, right, yes. That's the first point, you pay. The, uh, uh, the historic signs were intended to be mounted on or in front of a house. As Carol pointed out, they're 15 by 18 inches. A historic marker is the, the text on a pole, the roadside markers that you see. Um, and generally, we recommend people go through one of the issuing entities in the state, either the Alabama Historical Commission, which requires that a property be listed or there be something there. Um, if it's the site of something that is no longer there, um, then the Alabama Historical Association is happy to help in those cases. Um, we are in the process of having a marker produced for Bill Trailer to place downtown to coincide with the screening of the documentary um, in October. So, um, and that's through the Alabama Historical Association because the RSA parking deck is on the property where he set up shop, so. Okay, all right. Any other comment or question regarding our historic sign program? Okay, thank you so much. Preservation leadership class, Dallas Hanbury, Brian Mann, and Carol King. Uh, no report, Mr. Chairman. We're pretty far out from next year's class, which I imagine will take place in April or thereabout. Um, we will wait to see what happens with the budget, um, but I think we should um, look at the surveys we got and talk about what we yeah. might need to tweak um, and also kind of maintain contact with the individuals who offered to help, who all have experience both with curriculum development and marketing, um, who took the class and expressed interest in helping us in the future with future classes, whether it's another preservation leadership class or other offerings. So I have put, I have put a budget request in to fund a hands-on workshop this fall. So that may come up to do uh, window repair. Window repair? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we'll see, I don't know when 
they'll plan to vote on the budget. I don't know if they're kicking that can down the road with elections coming up or what. So I don't know what what we might get that will help um, fund that without any sponsorship. So basically, we we just need to hold on for another month or so before we really. We still have a little bit of money left from last year because we were able to put that right. in a special fund. Um, so I would envision. I mean, we've, we've got a little bit. I have not talked to Hilda in depth about um, the length of workshop and how much that would be. Um, oh, oh th this is just for the window. Mm -hmm. just, just, just talking about how to repair yeah. windows and relays and, and, you know, probably kind of like we did in the class, talked about the sash weights and just kind of the anatomy of a window. Um, you know, she asked, she said she could do an hour, she could do two hours, she could do half a day. So. I think I think a half a day Saturday workshop would be good. Um, in terms of like the actual full length six week program or whatever, eight weeks, whatever we had, six weeks. You were obviously like super involved with that. In your opinion, when do we really, really need to buckle down on planning next year's? When when we what? Planning next year's program. So we're in mid August, and we didn't do it till what like April last we, this year. Open March. registration in January, and we mm -hmm. closed registration mid-March. So we actually kind of need to be thinking about because um, we we had to order T-shirts mm -hmm. and line up the space and the bag. I mean, we had a bunch mm -hmm. of materials to assemble because I had to, I put all those binders together. Um, we had it coincide with the applications for the awards program. I guess all this to say, when do you think we need to start planning next year? I mean, do we need to start like now <laughs> or soon? Probably soon to talk about what we need to do differently. Um, if we do, if we decide to do a different, I think that our architecture class needs to be split in two. I think we need to do an anatomy class and then a styles class instead of trying to cram it together because I think everybody. Everybody's comment was that they learned something, but it was too much material at once, which means something else needs to go away. So we need to look at what we can get rid of, or if there's another topic that needs to be covered, who might be a good speaker for that? Because I did, what, four of them? Oh, yeah, I the really, lion's share. I really share. don't want to do four of them. <laughs> now, granted, PowerPoints are done for three of them, but right. um, so we, we need to look at that and start thinking about who might be a site set up where the public could could yes, I, I don't think we need to go into the weeds on that this year but you know if there's a good response sure. from what some of you know notable community figures produce then maybe in subsequent mm -hmm. years we do we, we open it up and ask for those community submissions so one of the things that I have my interns do is we typically when we get a new collection once we process it we create a digital exhibit online mm -hmm. And this just seems tailor-made. Yeah, it's, it's a perfect intern project, yeah. you know, so that's something to think about. Okay. I don't know how many people remember reading the local newspaper a couple of decades ago, but a gentleman by the name of Tom Connor wrote <laughs> yeah. an article. Oh, yeah. Right? I was just thinking right. yeah. and, and I remember that. Yeah. Called Remember When. Remember, remember when. when. That's right. And it's amazing some of the installments that he had yes. of uh, days gone by in local history that he brought to our attention yes. in a cartoon almost like form. Mm -hmm. Some of the eateries, um, uh, establishments downtown, some of the things that went on around town, but Tom Connor had it all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember those columns well. Yes. But they were published in the paper yes. on a, at least a weekly, I'm not real sure, and then the paper did publish at least two bound volumes hmm. that oh, we really? use for research all the time. Okay. Yeah, at least. Yeah. You know, you could buy them, you know, for Christmas presents or whatever, too. So but this is this is a, a lot like that. True. <clears throat> Are they still available? I doubt. No, you might be able to find it in like a used book or something store. like that. But, uh -huh. so. <laughs> yeah. but Tom Connor is the person we're talking about right now who really did his very best to capture uh, days gone by from local history and put it in the Montgomery Advertiser for everybody to see. And as far as I know, those installments were well received. I remember them well. I do too. I don't know how many other people do, yes. I remember them well when I was real small and uh, they appeared in the newspaper. Okay, anything else? Like in general? 
Yes. Oh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, Montgomery County has a new county website, which is much improved. It looks great. Check it out. And along with that, the Montgomery County Archives has a new collections management website, which has, I think, at last count, 1,800 digitized pictures on it and some oral histories, just a lot of content that we work really, really hard on. Um, and you can see it all at home. You don't have to come downtown if you don't want to. Oh, so, okay. all right. And all our fi collection finding aids are on there as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, give out your telephone number right quickly if you don't oh mind. Oh, my God, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. 832 <A32> 7173. <laughs> I, I use it so much I don't even think about it. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> trying to put you on the spot. I just want people to be able to get in yeah, touch yeah, with you. Yes, okay. Uh, Carol King has a PowerPoint presentation you'd just like to run by us right quickly. Okay, I can do it from here. If you'll start me up, please. I just want to tell you an event that we're having at Old Alabama <coughs> Town, um, the end of September. Uh, we're partnering with the Slave Dwelling Project, which is a project of um, Joseph McGill out of uh, South Carolina. And what he started doing about seven or eight years ago was going around the country documenting slave dwellings. That's one, just one dwelling at a time. And so he just spends the night in them. Um, it's pretty plain and simple um, what he does. He works on his, with historic sites and he works with museums and, um, and then he works with individuals as well. He uh, slept in our slave quarters at Old Alabama Town. When he first started, we were the first place outside the state of South Carolina that he actually, oh, there we go, uh, that he actually um, slept. And he writes, he blogs, he videos puts things online while it's happening. He now actually has a, a, a fairly large social media following as well as a membership within the Slave Dwelling Project. Um, this is, he's in a, um, doing an educational event in Mississippi. Okay, go ahead. Um, these are just notes that he's written uh, about just sort of alerting the public to what's going on in other Holly Springs, Mississippi, school groups, Go ahead. Uh, Mississippi, he's spent a lot of time in Mississippi. And when I said he's, he went around the country, he actually does, because you'd be surprised how many places up uh, north that he's actually spent as well, because there were enslaved people up there as well. This is North Carolina, Virginia. Uh, and all of these are um, housing outbuildings, wood, brick, that uh, housed enslaved people, Charleston. This is actually where he works now at Magnolia Plantation. Uh, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. Okay. Another South Carolina. He also does a lot of photo ops, if you've noticed. <laughs> um, he has a very active um, Facebook page. Um, and. It, this is basically what we all say, you know, sh shouldn't somebody do something about this? And this was just a way that he saw that he could do it. St. Mary's, Maryland. Yeah. You see all the different types and architectural styles. Um, he slept here at the Orderman House. This is a, a picture of a house that was documented in 1934 in the church, uh, the corner of Church and Potomac Street. This is actually the slave quarters um, of the Five Picket House, which is now Montgomery County Historical Society, uh, and um, Siebel's Ball and Near House. Um, it's interesting, these are Montgomery houses that are two-story. We had very elaborate um, dwellings, as well as another comparable one in Mobile. Uh, this is our um, work area, work yard is what we now call it. Um, our kitchens are on the bottom, and then our uh, slave quarters are on the top. And this is a photo of uh, Joseph when he was, uh, his last time he was here, and he slept over with a college class from um, Florida. Hmm. And this is, this is just his goal, changing the narrative, one slave dwelling at a time. So he'll be visiting with us um, Friday, Saturday, uh, September 20 and 21st on Friday night. Um, You've got a flyer there. He'll be doing a presentation at, at 6 o'clock uh, at the Old Alabama Town Reception. And then on Saturday, all day long, uh, in our slave dwelling site there, he and uh, Jerome Bias, who is uh, 
a food ways demonstrator will be will be cooking in our kitchens as well. So those are the um, particular activities that are free and open to the public. So mark your calendars. We actually have uh, on our site eight um, slave dwellings and a lot more uh, of our structures have some relationship to enslaved. You know, we, we have the big house, but we don't have the outbuildings. But so we actually have um, eight structures. Um, and so he, he likes to visit with us because we are such a large um, educational teaching tool. So um, it's a very interesting person and you might want to follow him on Facebook as well. It's a slave dwelling project. That's very interesting. Comments, question. Uh, Kayla, can you give a telephone number if somebody can call you sure, or call you can give, uh, Landmarks um, Either or check us out, at, uh, check out our website, www.landmarksfoundation.com. There'll be a lot of information on that, or you can call me, 240-4512, and the flyer I gave you has all that information as well, too. Anything else? Again, to Ms. Christy Anderson, Ms. Paula Wade, thank you so much for coming out with us tonight and to our other commissioners. We'll see you on September 10, 2019. This meeting is now adjourned.